kind of get started here as we uh, step in here. And it's kind of a, an awesome, uh, we've got two great golf professionals, uh, two great facilities here in the Baltimore area. Uh, we have Mike Atkins, who's head professional at Green Spring Valley Hunt Club, along with Matt Fuller, who's the head golf professional at Caves Valley Golf Club. Uh, we're going to kind of start off today with Matt and uh, Matt has been the head pro at Caves Valley now for 15 years. Um, if you've not been, I mean, either one of these shots, but if you go into Caves Valley, you, you kind of, there's a great, lot of great merchandise presented very well. Uh, they do about 15,000 rounds and uh, we'll just say the dollar amount that uh, they do per year uh, is, is into seven figures. And uh, Matt's been very instrumental in that. I've gotten to work with Matt for six years. So I kind of know firsthand what Matt does, how he, how he does his business and how he runs the shop. Uh, so he's been able to kind of turn things over um, with, with club sales that while I was there that we kind of added in a bunch of clubs and added in uh, different companies that really thrived uh, our business there along with, uh, you know, doubling the overall merchandise in the 15 years he's been there. So Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Uh, let me just uh, go to my screen share here. I want to just thank you. Thank the MAPGA for having uh, Mike Atkins and myself on to speak to the group today. Um, <clears throat> it's exciting. It's exciting for me to, uh, to be here. Uh, I'm just going to get a, just give me one second here. Okay, let's get just get dialed in. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there's a couple of different, there's a lot of different directions that I could go with our retail operation. I mean, I could talk for a couple of hours about what we do, how we've been so successful. Um, but one thing I really want to focus on and dive into is is talking about e-commerce, uh, the growth of e-commerce, how it relates to our shop. Um, you know, we, we started our online shop a couple of years ago, and we've had a lot of success. Uh, we, we had some challenges along the way. There's just a couple of retail facts. So we have a 400 square foot shop. Uh, it's a large profit center for our, for our club. Uh, the club owns the shop. Uh, and we've really grown our, our operation, our retail sales since the mid-90s, except for two years. During the housing crisis, which everybody's certainly aware of and uh, uh, from 19 to 20 uh, during COVID. While everybody else had a phenomenal year of rounds, you know, our rounds were certainly down just due to the lack of uh, national members and the lack of traveling and everybody getting on the planes. Uh, we've also made a big push to uh, increase our presence with lifestyle brands, um, which, which um, I'm happy to comment on uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so this, just a quick survey here, and I want to, let's just see who's, uh, who's paying attention here, but, and I'm going to mention this a few times, uh, conversion rate. So in the e-commerce world, your conversion rate, uh, you'll find out pretty quickly that it's quite important as to how many sales you'll have. Um, just a wild guess, uh, go ahead and put it into the chat, but what do you think our conversion rate or average conversion rate has been for the past two years? Just a wild guess wild guess and uh, uh, you know the, the person who gets the closest to it uh, here in the next couple of minutes um, I'll send you a BMW Case Valley hat but just this little survey here um, Patrick C is a good friend of mine I'm, I've been a member of Golf Business Network for for, for many years as um, as many of you on the on the call probably are as well um, and he sent me some a little bit of data uh, this past week, um, and he surveyed a lot of clubs that are in the, the network. Uh, he got 161 responses back. And you'll see here, 42% of clubs have an online shop, 58% do not. Out of those 50, 42%, 68, nearly two thirds launched their shop after COVID. So you can kind of see, you know, more and more shops especially the shops that have, uh, you know, rather high volume of sales are, are starting to go to their members um, in, different, in different ways. Um, and I know a lot of you 
probably have a significant amount of your members are local. But for us, you know, I feel like um, I, I felt like not a lot of our locals would uh, would support the online shop, but a lot of our locals go into the shop, they'll see something they like, and then uh, their next visit to the club, they'll they'll kind of search for it and they'll they'll actually buy it in person. So best time to start an online shop is is right now. If you haven't done so, um, there's certainly a growing demand for online shopping. You can see, you know, Amazon uh, launched in 1994. We've seen a significant amount of growth. Uh, you know, 44% of U.S. e-commerce grew from 19 to 20. Um, a lot of uh, statistics are out there, but 95% of retail is projected to be online by 2040. And then COVID. I mean, that has certainly been a, a big driver of uh, online growth. So why are we, you know, this is important. Why are we selling online? Um, you know, we have a national membership and we recognize a need to sell online. We have uh, a, a lot of regional and national members that were interested in buying product, uh, but, you know, only coming to the club once a year, twice a year, three times a year, you know, it's hard for them to support us. So that's kind of how we got started um, is, is just with a, a, a portion of our members kind of living out of the state. It's also a nice increased revenue stream for us. Um, we can sell products on our website that we necessarily don't have to inventory. Um, you know, like, and I'll show you, we'll, we'll give a few examples here in a minute, but we can sell, you know, large uh, uh, lith lithographs, we can sell, sell large frame prints, we can sell Yeti coolers. I mean, these are all items that we don't have to order, you know, 10 to 20 units of in order to sell them. Now, what we do do is we do tell the, you know, it's kind of written up in our description online where, you know, okay, please expect a week or two weeks to fill this order. So it's not certainly not going to be like an Amazon Prime where you're going to get some of those items the next the next day. Uh, the last 18 months, or you know, nearly two years since we started the shop, uh, we've just been selling to our members. That was kind of the initial plan. But part of our growth is how are we going to how are we going to grow? How are we going to increase our our sales stream? And now we're opening it up to guests, you know, friends and family of uh, Kings Valley members. Uh, can reach out to us. We'll give them a pass, a passcode, and then they can go onto the site and uh, you know browse and then uh, pay with a credit card uh, during the checkout process. You can also sell during the winter. I mean, we're certainly a seasonal operation, uh, open for six months. Golf shop stays open year round, as do the uh, the business offices. But it allows us to kind of sell online in the winter time, move some inventory. You know, the sales aren't significant, but it's, you know, it's enough where it's, it's, a, it's a nice flow. Now, this is, I think, for, for me and certainly for, for Mike, Mike's on the call, our lead assistant. He had a, a he was very instrumental in getting this uh, uh, launched off the ground. But for us, it was kind of like, how do you get started? You know, and that took a while. We didn't really know if we wanted to build the site ourselves, what platform we were going to use. So you can kind of see a few bullet points in here. Um, back in March 2016, that's when we first started having internal discussions about selling online. How do we do it? How should we do it? You know, and, and then we had a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, a time warp about a year and a half later. Um, actually, not quite. Less than a year later, we met with Vanguard Pro Shops. You know, we talked, you know, we spoke to a few pros in the Northeast. That were using Vanguard Pro Shops and thought, okay, we didn't really know much else at that point. Met with them. It was a great presentation, but we just decided to pursue other options. I mean, they're more of a company that you're kind of licensing out your logo. So you're not really necessarily moving your inventory, although you're getting a percentage of sales. Uh, okay, so a little bit of, uh, of work here. Uh, fast forward, we started to meet with uh, Shopify. Love their, love their, um, love really their platform from the very beginning. Uh, met with them in January. You know, we had some help along the way. We reached out, you know, leveraged our resources. 
and uh, you know, and I would say February of 19 was a big month for building out our shop. I mean, it's it's certainly an off-season project. There's no way any of us could have done in the in, you know in the middle of the summer. Uh, but it took a good month and a half to build it out. We did some you know some soft launches. And then, and then April 1st of 19 is when we really launched it. And, you know, our first day of sales, we had 192 sessions and a 4.6% conversion rate. Um, so hopefully all of you have entered uh, a guess into the chat, but our average conversion rate right now is three and a half percent. Now, if you would have asked me if 3% was good when we first launched the site, I'm going to you. That seems that seems low. There's no way. I mean, we have to be higher than that. Well, I mean, Amazon, Amazon's about the has about the highest conversion rate of any uh, e-commerce entity, and they're at 13 percent. So 13. So you know, just to explain a conversion rate, so 13 out of every hundred sessions or visits are converted into sales. So we deem we're at three and a half percent, and we're always. I mean, we're certainly looking to increase that number. So yeah, when, once we got to the, to the stage of actually choosing Shopify, I mean, here are a couple of bullet points, but you know, they're an all-in-one commerce platform. Uh, they have a low monthly cost. I mean, I didn't know what to expect or how much it was gonna cost to use them. I mean, we pay $29 a month. That's all we pay. I mean, there's certainly credit card transactional fees, you know, which we're, you're going to pay anyways if somebody comes into your shop, but we pay $29 a month. Now, they have plans that range all the way up to $2,000 a month, uh, but for us, it satisfies a lot of our needs. There's no coding, so once you kind of have the theme and what you're looking to do, you know, the, the customer service side of it, I mean, they'll kind of help you along the way. So building the store, you can kind of see a few uh, images in the background there. Uh, you know, those are taken from Jordan, our shop merchandiser. Uh, we set up a little, in the offseason, we set up a little photo tent in the locker room, and that's where she took all the photography. When we first launched the site, we were just getting um, stock images from our vendors. But then we found out rather quickly that our members wanted to see, you know, product on the website with the Caves logo. I mean, you know, when you're showing a Peter Millar shirt, let's have the logo on the chest. And, and it made sense. Um, so we kind of revamped. It took us about another few weeks to reshoot all the photos. Uh, we got a lot of sample product in from our vendors and then uh, kind of relaunched the shop uh, a couple months after the initial one. So you'll see here, kind of building the store. Um, Product assortment uh, categories. You know, you kind of you need to think about like what categories you want to have. Our categories that we had two years ago are certainly different than the categories we have now. Um, so we have youth, we have men's, we have women's, we have accessories. You know, this past summer when we were able to start selling BMW Case Valley branded merchandise, we have now the a category that's uh, labeled BMW Championship. Uh, you have to invest in Topography equipment. Okay, so we upgraded our camera. You can see kind of the tent, uh, the little you know the lights in the in the foreground here. Um, the fulfillment side of shipping product out is is also very important. Uh, you know you don't want to take an order and then end up shipping it out, you know four to five days later. So we invested, you know, in in all new uh, gift boxes. We even bought a custom Case Valley packing tape, which is a nice, nice touch. Um, you know, I'm going down the list here, but product descriptions. Okay, leverage your vendors to kind of help you with, you know, getting descriptions of the product. You're not necessarily going to take, you know, their, their item word for word and use it yourself, but you can put a little twist to it or a little tweak to it. I mean, that's a big time saver. You just get a lot of the descriptions from, uh, you know, from your vendors' websites. Fundamentally, I think the checkout process is the, the, the most important part of the, the online shop. If you have a checkout process that's uh, not, that's lengthy, that's not simple, what's going to happen is you're going to have a lot of people leave items in 
the shopping cart and they're not going to convert that to a sale. So I'm sure that's happened to all of us. I mean, I've certainly gone to a website and just I don't, whatever reason you just leave an item in the cart and then you, you exit out of there. Um, also leverage your IT department. Um, you know, Wade Gibbons in our business office was very instrumental in kind of helping us get off the ground, you know, because on the tech side, um, you know, we were lacking that a little bit. So, you know, leverage anybody you can. Um, I've got a very important guest on the call today who I'll introduce a little bit later on. But um, David Chick was also very instrumental in, in helping us get launched. So, Matt, I got a question for you. Okay. So questions questions been posed. I mean, obviously, Caves is a large, larger operation than yeah. what most of your clubs in our area are. But do right. the sites like like uh, Jeremy Griner kind of asked the question, are sites like the the Shopify and Wix, are they necessarily for the small shops? I mean, you kind of mentioned you have to decide what kind of categories you want to do and stuff. Is there a certain amount that, you know, when you guys were going into this that you needed to sell in order to be online? No, you can sell as little as you want. You could sell, I don't know, you could put five images up there. There's no limit whatsoever. Shopify makes all of their money on transactional fees. So they, two thirds of their revenue occur from credit card transactions. So they're gonna do whatever they can to help you along the way, increase your sales. Um, so if you have a shop that does, I don't know, let's just say 200, 250,000 annually, I still think that it's just managing it. You're just updating the product. You know, maybe this product's not selling as well, you take it down. Um, um, uh, category glass where that's the reserve red wine glasses. I mean, that's a stock image from Sterling Cut Glass. Leverage your vendors to produce images um, for you. You know, the image to the to the left is more of an image that that we took ourselves. Easy to, um, you need to have, I think you need to have, definitely have great imagery, you know, use, go to the person on staff that's really good at taking photos. I mean, a lot of the people these days are really good at taking photos with their iPhones and, you know, the iPhones, like, what do we have? The iPhone 10 now, or I don't even know, iPhone 10 or 12, it's, I mean, they're all high megapixels. Okay, so let's see here now. Just give me one moment. I'm just going to pull up. Stretch this out. You guys see that okay, Sean? Yes. Okay, so now I'm going to take you to our, our, um, our home page. Now, normally you log into, if you haven't been to our website before, you log into a page and you have to put in your password. So we're just going to bypass that step and take you right here. But you'll see up top, we have BMW Championship, Holiday. Holiday, we're getting ready to take down. Um, we have members only, our members only logo, which you'll see down here is, is all red. Men, women, youth, and accessories. So... And we can just click on here, accessories. We can kind of just scroll down. You'll see, you know, Seamus uh, product, fall markers, money clips, uh, LEM belts. You know, and then you'll see this little pop up here where, you know, you can certainly describe, subscribe to our website. This is going to be for more for guests probably than our members. Now that we're opening up the, the shop to, to guests, just exit out of there. We're just kind of scrolling. scrolling down. Okay, 
Okay, so this is kind of a neat item and many of you are kind of aware of the fire pit. So this is a perfect example of an item that we really don't need to stock in inventory. You know, we can sell it on our shop, um, you know, as long as we communicate that it's not gonna necessarily ship out overnight. Um, most of the time the members uh, don't really mind as long as that's communicated in advance, but I can, I'll just take you through kind of a sample order. So we just add this to the cart. And uh, why don't we put in Sean's mobile number here? We'll place a little fire pit order for Mr. English. I need one for the back porch. Sean, what's your uh, what's your address at Elkridge? Sixty one hundred North Charles Street. So it populates pretty easy to do. I'm going to continue the shipping. Okay, we'll just you know, do a bunch of different shipping uh, options here. Pick up in the golf shop, free ground. I mean, this is just like curbside pickup. You know, you can expedite it or you could ship it. You could certainly ship it overnight. Okay, we're going to build. So Matt, as you're, as you're doing this, I want, I want, uh, Nick has a question about. How much time is dedicated to fulfilling orders and posting new product to your website? Do you have one person? I mean, so in other words, you have one person on your staff that's kind of responsible for doing this. And how how much how many hours are they spending doing this? Uh, so that's a gr that's a great question. We have a couple of individuals. We have Mike and Jordan who are really responsible for the fulfillment side. Um, they're also uh, play a big a large role in updating the product. Um, so it's, it's, I would say it's for us, at least it's a two person job and you can see here, let me just, I don't know if I can show that to you guys. Okay. So, so you see right here, I mean, I automatically just, I get an email on every order that's placed. It doesn't mean necessarily I'm the one that's going in fulfilling it, but, uh, there's three of us that kind of look at the orders and then as long as we're in the shop, we're going to do our very best to fill it that day and ship it out. So you can kind of see, and Sean, you can also, did you get a text? That I did. Okay, so just show, I don't know if the group can see you at all, but you can kind of show them the text. I don't see that. I okay. probably can't with your share screen, but let me see here. Okay, now show them again. Yeah, so Sean just got a text and I mean, that's nice communication right there. So let's go here. I want to make sure that I don't uh, get too lengthy here, so I'm just going to kind of move back. Wife's going to be happy that she gets a uh, fire pit here now, Matt. Yeah, and I charge a member account, so you need to make sure you give me a credit card. <laughs> All right, so keys to a successful online shop. I'm just going to kind of brief, uh, you know, go over these really quickly, but, you know, we, and we've discussed them all. Easily shoppable. Make sure you have a good mobile option. That's really important. Um, Quick checkout process, you know, feature your club's logo. I mean, that's important. Um, and, you know, great photography, but don't, just don't rush it. You know, test everything before you launch. I mean, we did several test launches before actually launching the site. And the, and the more you do, the more familiar you become with it. So these are just a few metrics um, that we look at. Uh, we're very data driven. So we like to look at our conversion rates. Um, our conversion rate between Black Friday and Christmas is 9.8%. And you'll see our, our average conversion rate right now is 3.5%.
We have an 18% returning customer rate. We've done 3,000 online sessions since we've launched our shop. Um, I still think we have a lot of room to grow. So, you know, we're, we're trying to improve. Um, and you have to be able to know how to promote your site. So every time we send out a, a promotional email, we typically get 150 to 200 online sessions right after uh, we send that email out. So like right now, if I go on to our website traffic, we may have one session a day, maybe two. But if I were to send out an email next week or later this week, you know, we could certainly jump that number. So you got to have a balance. You can't promote too much, but you got to just, you got to find that balance and in, in, in what works for you and in, in your uh, facility. Uh, research consumer behavior, um, you know, the perception of free shipping. I mean, figure out a way to include free shipping into your, into your site. You know, if you need to increase your product pricing, uh, then, then do so. Um, but more people will buy off your shop if you offer free shipping. Most of the time, it's hard to find a website right now where you have to pay for shipping on items, you know, over 50 bucks. You'll see here, you know, I've already told you about our conversion rate, but 6.6% um, of cave shoppers reach checkout with a 3.5% conversion rate. So figure out what the gap is what that gap is. Why are, why are uh, individuals, consumers leaving product in the cart, but not converting it? So, you know, for us, I mean, that's one gap that we're trying to, to minimize if we can. Okay, these are just some of the goals that we have for, for this year. You're certainly always working on upgrading the checkout experience. Uh, up until November, we only allow members to, to shop on the website. Now we're opening it up to Shopify payments, which is certainly going to increase our sales now that uh, you know uh, members and guests can use credit cards. Um, you know we're, we talked about research and con consumer behavior, which is changing rapidly, increasing our conversion rate. You know, think about it. If we could just double our conversion rate, that's a double in sales. Uh, and then streamlining fulfillment. So those are just a few, um, you know, those are just a few bullet points in the, in the short amount of time. Uh, these are just a few takeaways. Um, you know, just be prepared to make changes along the way. I mean, it's not like a, when we launched our shop, it wasn't like this is the way it's going to be for the next two years. You know, you just, you're rapidly tweaking it. You're making changes, um, improvements. Uh, you know, so man, I'm going to throw a few more questions at you that's kind of popped in here. Okay. So what percentage of orders are drop shipped directly to members versus being picked up or shipped from the shop? I would say, Sean, considering two-thirds of our members are, you know, are local, um, you know, still a third of our members live out of town, I would say... 90% are drop shipped. Even if somebody lives 15, 10, 15 miles away, they're going to take advantage of the drop ship, especially if they don't have to pay for shipping. Okay. If it's in the summer, if it's in the summer and they're planning on playing at the club the next couple of days, they may pick, pick it up in the shop. But we see a lot more drop ships than uh, than curbside or or pickups in general. Right. And you use, um, of course, you know, being there and stuff, I know this, but even uh, Nick Cannon here is mentioning that you use Golf Genius for your golf shop. Is that tied in? And you might just, just describe what Golf Genius might, what it is, how do you use it? But then is it tied into the Shopify at all? Uh, golf Genius is is not tied into Shopify. I mean, we, we've been using Golf Genius for, for, for several years. Um, on the on the platform of uh, entering in special orders, so that's more for an order that's um, you know could be an could be an online order where we don't have the inventory or it's, or it's an in, in person order, and we're we're literally going on to Golf Genius, plugging in the order, and that allows us to be able to track it, place it with the rep, um, 
and that's a nice platform, but no, they don't, they don't tie in with each other. They may down the road, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. So, right, so out. yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to, yep. You're going, you're, you're moving to David. I'm going to move to David. Um, you know, I want to introduce a good friend of mine, David Schick. We've known each other for, oh gosh, I want to say 10 to 12 years. Um, he is a former, former data retail analyst. He's authored over 10,000 articles on luxury, uh, consumer goods, sporting goods. He loves golf. He runs the Think Tank, Think Tank for Steeple. Um, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen now so you can get on. Yeah, but he runs the Think, think Tank at Steeple, uh, Nicholas, and um, he's a huge Michigan Wolverines fan. And I just wanted, I thought it would be educational for him to come on. And I'm thankful that he's here. He just talked to the group just briefly. And, uh, you know, um, David, you want to take it from there? Sure. Thanks, Matt. Now, I just, I had thought, maybe it was just in my head, I thought you wanted me on to talk about like my strength training regimen and how that, what, like the long drives. And, but I guess that's a different call. I got it. What was all that? Like young, all that young Gary player talk is that is that was that a different maybe it's something separate sorry um sorry so I first of all uh thank you for that lead in and um thanks for having me on and and you know joking around of course as I always as Matt and I always do and Sean and I I was lucky to know Sean as well um uh but a sincere thank you just as a long-suffering golfer but as a father of two teen golfers and just a person, you know, a community member, I, you know, what you guys have done for just people is amazing. And thank you, uh, once in a hundred year event. And, you know, it's, uh, folks like you are letting people stay sane and safe and healthy. And, uh, thank you very much as a, as a neighbor, I, I live down in Chevy Chase. I'm a member at Chevy Chase down here and I've, have been at Stiefel a long time, part of the Stiefel kind of caves, uh, crew over the years. Um, so as Matt said, you know, we've been friends a long time. I've, I've worked with luxury companies, retail companies, and I think hopefully the lens and a couple of things to have you guys think about, and, and I'll go real quick so I can answer any questions. I've got to jump in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but the, the thing I would say is, you know, retail, or, you guys are omni-channel. So Amazon and Netflix, which isn't obviously stuff, it's content, but, you know, there's this hesitancy to think about Hey, my business, how do I have an online business? Retail is omni-channel. You know, everything is about having multiple channels. And it used to be a catalog and a store or a store and then a catalog. And online is just a living, breathing portion of that. You know that you guys all shop online, but it's a big difference, omni-channel businesses versus pure online. Um, and if you need any proof that you need to be omni-channel in both, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have been to the Amazon Go stores in New York or in Seattle, I've been to all of them and you walk right in. Uh, have you guys, you, Rick, wave your hand if you've been to an Amazon Go store where you scan your card on, you scan your phone on the way in, you grab what you want and you walk out and it charges you. There's nobody there. Kind of wild. So the point is Amazon wouldn't open those if th what you guys have omni-channel wasn't the way to go. Um, the trajectory has only accelerated. Matt had some good numbers. Um, the numbers I would use is think about the economy as about 15% online and now growing at about 30%. So it's just capturing, capturing, capturing share. Your categories are actually above that. Um, we can slice the data lots of ways. You can track that through you know, Wall Street research. You can track that through economists. There's a lot of really good public available data, publicly available data in the GDP reports. Um, if I had to give you one number to think about as you're thinking about this journey, and I was lucky that Matt called me and I got to you know, tell him what I thought and he could bounce ideas off me and vice versa as he was uh, growing his impressive business. Um, the number is 11 and a half. And I hesitate to say this because it was a study at Ohio State University, which I don't like to talk about a lot. Uh, I kind of start to break out in hives when I talk about anything Columbus related, but um, Consumers, Americans spend 11 and a half hours a day on a screen. So when you're thinking about, you know, and, and you mean a lot to your members and your guests. And so you're, you're sort of like, how do I connect with them? I mean, 11 and a half hours a day, nobody, well, not nobody, I've been, you know, maybe, maybe Hugh warns, but nobody else is 11 and a half hours a day at caves. Um, I'm just kidding, Hugh, when you watch the replay of this. Um, so this is the time when 
when that 11 and a half hours kind of inflected and became the way they think about all of their day parts and all of their shopping needs. Um, and, and I thought I would just bring up a couple ideas that Matt and I have talked about over the last couple of years as he's you know, ramped into his efforts and his um, you know, strategies around the space. Um, where Omnichannel gets really special is you know, kind of translating an experience. Um, so when I think about like the vision for what you guys can all have one day, you know, think about you know, how great it is to have a favorite ski place or beach place and go to their live webcam in the morning when you're stuck at home or you're at the airport thinking about getting ready to fly to Cleveland for some meeting, right? I can go see Stowe Mountain. I could, you know, you can see whatever beach you like. Well, think about that with your club. Think about um, telling some story, connecting. Matt was talking about pulling people in and he sees that bump in traffic. Think about just giving people more of that culture and that experience that they love being there with you, what you mean to them and sending that digitally, getting them engaged. Don't worry about, in my opinion, is you know don't worry about having a hundred SKUs or 200 SKUs online or 500 or a thousand. Start with just having them say, look, you know, in whatever way you can affordably have some translation of that special impact. You can look at, um, um, you can, I'm reading the putt, Jeremy, we haven't met, I can't put better than you. So um, the, trust me. So um, the, where I was going with this is I would look at a couple examples and, and think about a couple things as you, as you go down the path. And I'll give you my work email and Matt can connect us and I'm happy to, you know, I just love what you guys do for everybody. So I'm happy to be here. Um, one is, you know, think about the experience and, and bringing them into being there, whatever that might mean. The cocktail of the month, you don't have to send it, but just a recipe. I'm sure some of you guys are doing stuff like that anyway, but tying that in. The second thing with luxury is limited edition means a ton. You all know that because you run those stores and you probably do this naturally. But when, you know, a handbag manufacturer or a luxury apparel maker says, this is one of a thousand hats we made, bags we made, whatever, it means a lot. And you can really translate that online, right? Because you can give them that sense of urgency or this is the 2020 model. And at the end of this year, you won't be able to get this hat in that color or whatever. You can actually deliver, I think, more of that content and that idea of scarcity and specialness um, in an online kind of education. Um, again, tying it back into um, you know, the experience of being there, what's going on that day. And, and Matt talked a little bit about being data-driven. Um, Think about the backwards flow. So great luxury companies use the data they're seeing online to go back in and, and see, wow, that, you know, that polo is really selling in purple. Let's move that to the front table in the store, or it's really not selling. Let's move that to the back because that'll draw more eyes in. So you don't need to set up a, you know, maybe some level of Shopify or whatever you work with might give you some of those analytics, but you'll be able, you all have that sense anyway, your retailers and your merchants. And so just think about using that data to drive, um, you know, kind of other learnings and, and, and communication. So those are the things that, that really popped to mind. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I've got to jump in about 10 minutes to a call. I know you guys have a lot to cover. Um, I think there's always a, the last thing I would say, there's always a temptation to say, we shouldn't do it. It's going to cannibalize our sales. And Matt, we talked a lot about that, right? Like, Hey, people are here anyway, they're shopping and it's, it is not, it is additive. And the ones you're losing are the ones you don't have by not having it. I don't mean throw the budget away or do it irresponsibly, but it's not cannibalizing. It's, uh, it's just the way the world. So, and you know that because of your personal life. So anyway, I'll stop there. Well, Dave, I'm going to jump in here real quick. And I, I, there, there is a question kind of coming to you. Um, and it's, it's, if, you're un, if you are unable to do an online store, how important is it to have some type of social media presence with your golf shop? What have you seen from social media and how that helps people get more sales in yeah. the golf shop? I mean, I, I think that would depend on your, on your member base. And, and if that's the channel that they want to receive, you know, that they want the content. So I don't know, you know, there's the email open rate, Matt talked about conversion. Um, social media is where people spend a lot of time. I think the problem with social media is that it's where, there's just so much there. It's pretty hard to cut through. Um, I don't know that there's one magic bullet. I think it's knowing your, your members and, and how you want to be reached. I'll tell you, you can, and I don't like this as you get to scale because I think you drive yourself crazy, but you can send an email 
that's really nicely formatted. You can fake e-commerce for a while, right? You can say, we just got this, this, and this in, call the shop. You know, I mean, I worked in a, you know, I've done this for almost 25 years, about 30, almost 30 years ago, I worked at a store in Ann Arbor and it was a catalog business. And, you know, it was the beginning of the internet as well. And it wasn't, I mean, you literally got the order. And then like Matt said, you went and picked it and packed it and shipped it. It was a store. And so you can, you can just start to send stuff out and kind of warm it up by sending out three special items. We've only got a hundred of these. We made whatever, you know, engrave this, engrave that. So you could probably walk before you run. I think the, the Nirvana is where Matt is. And I know he's got a lot of national members and all the rest of it, but he, what, then you're going to get that data. You're going to understand, you know, colorways and, you know, price points and elasticity and all the rest of it. Um, so if you want to, you know, kind of hand do it, you can do it by sending out emails for a while with some items and just say, Hey, you can, you know, while we work on our e-commerce site, um, shoot us an email with what you want and we'll get right back to you. It's not slick, but it, but it, if it's a nice looking email, it's fine. That's good information there. So just let everybody know uh, on the link that I did send you for this, uh, for the webinar, Dave's email is actually listed in the carbon copy side of it. So you actually already have Dave's email. So if you do have any questions, um, I'm pretty sure it's the way I kind of set it up. So that would be, you could uh, email you with any questions and so forth. So. Before we kind of move, I know Dave's got to go, so I don't want to kind of hang him, hold on to him too long. Does anybody else have any questions? I see we have another question, but I'm going to throw that to Matt. So um, anybody else have any questions? You can even unmute your mic real quick and, and ask the question if you have something else. Okay, so I don't see anything. Dave, I'm going to thank you very much, obviously, for being, uh, being on here. Uh, obviously, it's good to see you. Uh, it's, it's always great. And uh, I'll leave you with, uh, did you see that Buckeye win last night against Michigan State? But my TV wasn't working. It was, uh, we, we have off, okay. you know, we're in, we're in a two-week protocol. I can't talk about it with, you know. <laughs> All right, it was good to see you right. there. Thanks, uh, Thanks, guys. Matt, I've got one question uh, posed to you from Eli that uh, talks about, uh, really talks about merchandising from the, you know, you're doing any anniversary merchandising coming up, but let's talk about more of, of how Caves, you kind of did something special with your logo several years ago in making a member's logo, but I think kind of one of the things that Eli's trying to say is how much do you work on kind of merchandise specifically like limited to some like the BMW BMW championship where you have the caves logo and BMW. We've had other events there when we had the uh, ladies event LPJ event there. How often do you kind of pull up uh, special logos? You know, our, our logo is uh, it travels well. I mean, it's highly recognizable. So we don't spend that much time in trying to recreate the wheel, I guess. And trying to oh it's we're hitting 30 years let's try to you know uh, we incorporate our logo into a 30 year anniversary i do agree that limited edition items are items that are going to sell uh, we're going to sell a lot of so if we can if we can tie in selling a limited edition item into an anniversary without really altering our logo you know maybe when we hit 50 years i think that would be a big milestone but up until now we really haven't uh, done a whole lot with um, recreating our logo. Very good. All right, so we're going to actually flip it over a little bit and kind of head over to uh, Green Spring Valley Golf Club now. And uh, we have Mike Atkins, who's a head golf professional at Green Spring Valley Hunt Club. Uh, he has been, this will be his fifth year uh, at Green Spring Valley, comes also from um, Hey. Um, Hay Harbor Golf Club and Fishers Island, New York. So um, this is Mike's fifth year. Their shop, if you haven't been in their shop, there's a their shop is, uh, to me, a, a shop that you walk in and kind of, it's got a comfort feel to it. It's something that you can uh, kind of come in and, and, and it's, a, it's a second home. So um, Mike, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Sean. Can everybody hear me okay? 
So, um, Matt, great information there. Dave, if you're still on, thanks for uh, sharing your insight. Um, you know, it's interesting as we talked about the e-commerce side of things and when Matt and I were discussing where we were going to go with this presentation, I'm talking about more of the in-golf shop experience. And um, I think there's a ton of e-commerce advantage out there. We are not currently on the e-commerce platform. However, we did do a kind of a Google Drive e-commerce when we were shut down for COVID, when we had new drops coming in to get that out in front of our membership and found success. Jeff, Jeff really led the way on that. So I think there's a um, balance between the two, but I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences that I've learned over the years and some things that um, I could do better at as well. So let me get my screen share going on here for us. Give me one second. Can you see that okay, Sean? All good. So again, um, just wanna share my thoughts and ideas and experiences. And the first thing I wanna talk about is, is really understanding your target audience. I spent uh, four years as the first assistant at Fisher's Island Club, which is, if you've ever been out there, it looks like an Easter egg hunt. It's bright pastels, um, you know, very, I never saw a black shirt at all on that piece of property. It was all these beautiful colors that were out. And then I ended up moving to uh, Montana to take on a head pro role at a club called Rock Creek Cattle Company. And uh, it looked a little bit more like the left picture there of, of shirts untucked, all these big bright patterns. So I had to adjust what I was um, used to seeing and what I was used to selling. So I had to re-educate myself. And the other thing is you had to educate yourself on what your audience is. So I know that we've got some public facilities on here, some privates and, and some resorts. So I think all of us probably look at this a little differently. And, and I thought about this merchandising experience right now, and it led me back to all the teaching and coaching seminars that I've been a part of. And everybody's belief and, and ideas are different, but I think the ultimate goal in that is to, to improve their student. And it's the same for us in merchandising. You're gonna find ways that are better than mine, that work better for you and things of that nature. But ultimately we're trying to sell more goods out of our facility and put a little bit of money in your pocket. So understanding your audience is the first thing that I think we have to understand as we start to build our golf shop and our culture of our golf shop. Which leads me into developing your brands and your partnerships. And I say partnerships because I think that when you look at this and you think about your golf shop, it's, you're going into partnership with these companies. They're not just not brands you're representing, but you're going to end up getting to know the reps. You're going to know their family. You're going to have all these experiences that are going to help you tell the story of your golf shop. So as you start, start finding your key pillars. We kind of live in the confines of Fairway and Green, B. Dratty, um, Peter Millar. We know that those are our bread and butter, tried and true. And then each spring and fall, we'll introduce a new line, whether it be Grayson, um, you know, a new line from San Soleil or something for our ladies, but we want to keep those variances coming in on a short base. And when we introduce those lines, we typically introduce them at about 24 piece um, buy. And that gives us enough to represent the product and tell their story. Yet, if it's a, if it's a failed launch, it's not going to kill us for the season of having all this abundance of inventory left over. So understand your audience, then develop your brands and partnerships to complement your audience. Visual displays, um, Matt mentioned investing into some new cameras and things of that nature for visual, for his uh, online purposes. But I think that you've got to capture them as you enter the golf shop as well. And you can see this is, um, there's a couple pictures of our front table as you walk in. There's a display that has some golf balls mapped out as the American flag, things of that nat nature. I think the visual displays are really what gets somebody into the active state of shopping. And then I think there's four keys that a consumer actually pulls the trigger on purchasing something. First is visual. The second is touch and feel. Um, very rarely do you see a, a, a member or a guest come in to purchase a sweater without really putting their hands on it, wanting to know the feel of that sweater. So that's the second. The third is the price. Um, again, as you start to understand your audience, you should start building out what prices work in your golf shop. Um, I've tested to go to a little bit lower price before at, at Greenspring, and it ends up being the, the product that I have sitting around at the end of the year. So we've kind of found our sweet spot of pricing. And then the, the fourth thing, which I think is probably the most important thing that separates us as golf shops versus big box stores and the e-commerce is the story. Um, we have the opportunity to tell the story. 
Um, does anybody here know the story of, um, you know, B. Dratty or Shoes? Uh, shoes, I don't know if anybody sells shoes in their golf shop. I know Caves does. I think BCC does as well. But Shoes is a, a high end ranger, uh, is where they really started. Uh, they're a full line in their golf shop or in their golf offerings now. But they're a company that started um, from Lassie Shoes, who was an alpine skier. And he won multiple national medals for his skiing attributes. And when he was on the national team, he asked the company to find something that he could perform better in and still maintain that waterproof. And the vendors that they're working with couldn't find it. So he set out to create his own company to find, you know, rain gear essentially that moved better. Skiers started to wear it, golfers that ski end up going into fancy ski shops, buying $500, $600 ski jackets. And they're finding that they have more move, movable aspects than they do in their rain gear that they play golf in. So they started playing golf in this stuff and that's how shoes branched out into the golf world. Since then, a cushion has acquired them. But I think that if you can go in there and try and sell a $500 rain suit, you better have a story of why this member should buy that versus the competitor of foot with it, maybe a $200 rain suit. So once you have the story, I think it arms you with better skills to educate and grow yourselves. Then we start talking about the details of visual displays, um, paper folds. If, if anybody's been into our golf shop, you'll notice that it, all of our shirts are paper folded. Any of our shirts that are hung, we have them tied at the bottom just for the display presence that they're gonna look a little bit more appealing. Um, it gives us consistency, gives us an opportunity to pop our logo. Uh, we do use different weights throughout our, our apparel. Most of our knit shirts or golf shirts are gonna be with a heavier paper. It's gonna hold that integrity a little bit more. If we're going into sweaters or merinos and things of that nature, we're gonna to go to a lighter weight paper so it doesn't stack as high. And plus it's a little bit softer as you start to have that touch and we vary our styles of fold. Again, something that attracts you to looking at it. Uh, mannequins, I think is a thing that if you don't have mannequins in your golf shop or have multiple mannequins in your golf shop, uh, invest in more. I was fortunate enough this year to go down to um, Gibson Island where we had our Titleist fitting earlier in the year. And I walked in, the first thing I noticed in Dave's golf shop was his mannequins. And I thought, God, these are, these are great. Um, so, you know, make sure you have a good set of mannequins and be bold in your mannequins. Never just put a shirt and a pair of shorts on there. This is an opportunity to sell two or three items at a time. So build an outfit, something that's gonna be attractive that complements the time of year as well. Don't have somebody walk into your golf shop and it being 90 degrees and you're advertising cashmere sweaters and on your mannequins and, and things of that nature. So make sure it's complementing your season. Inject accessories into your table display. Um, if you kind of go back to our previous slide here, you can see in our ladies section, we're gonna have some candles, coasters, handbags, things of that nature. Men's, we're gonna have some golf ball shoes. So this is an opportunity for you to make things blend together and tell the story of that line. Um, I love Fairway and Green, they do a, a Made in USA. So I always want that front and center during the July 4th holiday, um, really showcasing that, telling the story about Made in USA. And I think Made in USA is a really important thing to be talking about right now, uh, given the climate of our, of our country. Um, I want to move on to how to buy, and this is something that um, really depends on your, your facility. Uh, I'm fortunate enough where I own the golf shop at Green Spring Valley Hunt Club, so I don't have, uh, you know, membership guiding me on how much I'm able to spend, but I really work mine off of, of numbers of units that I want to bring in, not necessarily from a dollar value, um, because, you know, $5,000 worth of Peter Millar fall goods looks a lot different than $5,000 worth of Adidas uh, apparel. So, you know, I work with more of a units based aspect and we also build a floor plan that says, um, you know, Peter Millar is going to live on this table on the first drop of spring. So that's going to give us a little bit clarity of, of how we're going to purchase for that. If it, if it holds 72 units, then we're going to make sure that we, we base our purchases off of that. We compare our prior year purchases with sell through. Um, last two years have been an interesting time of trying to do that with COVID challenging us, but I will say that we actually had um, a record year out of the golf shop this year, even through COVID, mostly because of the play we had. Um, I also do a lot of my buying and, and managing how I'm going to do my sales with our uh, outings that we have upcoming for the spring and fall and things of that nature. Gives you an opportunity to maybe move your items that have been laying around a little bit and get them into a guest hands versus um, contaminating your golf shop. Uh, connect with your network. One of my favorite things about going out to a pro-am or going to the PGA shows, having dinner with, you know, multiple pros throughout the country and learning from them what they're finding to be um, good 
good items for their shop and making sure that you're linking up with shops that are comparatively speaking. Um, you know, when I was again, kind of referencing Rock Creek, I took Smathers and Branson belts out there. And I mean, they're probably still in that golf shop five years later because that's just not their style. So you've got to make sure that you're looking at things that match your geographic, geographical location. Um, establish a healthy and honest rapport with your reps. I think this is something that I really strive to do every year is, you know, send all your rep, reps a Christmas card, uh, reach out to them on a, every six weeks or every three months and just check in to see how they're doing. I feel like that most of the time we get caught up in the aspect of, I need more golf balls for the golf shop or whatever it is. And we're never connecting them. And there's going to be a time in our career where we would need them for that, uh, that moment. So build that relationship with them. I know from a hard good standpoint, all of our staff, whoever they're representing on staff with, um, you know, they're, they're expected to be reaching out to their reps to make sure that everybody's uh, doing well in their family, especially during these challenging times. Ensure you purchase um, mannequin pieces, the peacock. So when I'm, buy, when I'm in the process of building out my orders for the year, if I'm having a, a conversation, conversation with B. Dratty, I may bring in an item that I don't think is really going to be a, a big seller, but I think it's an item that's gonna look great on a mannequin that's gonna be a conversation piece. And if I can get a member to come over and look at a mannequin and ask, what, what is, hey pro, what's this? It gives me the opportunity to educate and then I can show them maybe something that's a little bit more conservative in their palette, but it's gonna give me the opportunity to talk about what this product line is. And this is where it comes into again, to telling that story. Um, have diverse products. Not all items need to be golf specific. We're very much a, a family club. We've got a lot of families that live on our property. And um, I, I get members that come in frequently that are going to a graduation. The young lady doesn't play golf. However, she loves green spring. What do we have? So when you're looking at improving your merchandising, don't stay in the confines of what it has to be golf specific. I think Matt touched a little bit about that as far as getting a little bit more lifestyle driven. Uh, I think that's a really wonderful place to go, especially as we start seeing all these brick and mortar stores closing down due to the COVID pandemic. Um, we know that it's transitioning. Those type of stores are transitioning to e-commerce. So I think we've got to be a little bit more broad in our offerings. And be diverse. So your golf shop should be a place you want to shop. Um, Sean, you gave a compliment as you were introducing me and uh, saying a place that feels like home. And I, and I think that's the thing that we always try to, to strive for in our, in our shop is have it being a welcoming environment, having a place that you walk in and say, this is the type of apparel I want to have in there. Um, you know, it's amazing when you play out three different color navy blues, how there can be a particular brand that maybe doesn't match up to a Millar or to a fairway and green. So when you have those things, they stand out. So make sure you're, you're putting your golf shop where it complements each other, yet has a wide offering. Places to visit and study. Um, boutique shops, I love going into a fine men's store. I think they do unbelievable merchandising in there as far as visual displays. Uh, luxury general stores, I try to do my reading through GQ, Wall Street Journal has a ton of information, which Dave alluded to earlier a ton of data and what things are coming back into style. Um, I will say that style tends to be uh, on the East Coast about five years behind the West Coast. Uh, they were really running prints pretty aggressively about five years ago in California. Now on the East Coast, we're starting to see prints take off, but it's still going to be a little bit more of a conservative style print. I believe I was talking to uh, our rep from Peter Millar last year. Um, I think in 2018, there was about 5% of their sales were, were through prints. And I think they're up to about 25% of their sales are in prints now, or their offerings are prints. So again, it's starting to take off and, and we just want to try and be ahead of the curve when, when we look at our golf shop. Some wisdom that I learned along the way, I was talking about fine, fine um, men's stores. There's a gentleman that I've got to befriend when I was in college. His name's Steve Ashworth. He's third generation of Ashworth's Fine Clothing in Fuquay Verena. It's an awesome men's store. Um, they carry Millar, you name it, they have it in there. It's a beautiful place. And I was talking to him about managing merchandise, not just visualizing, but how do you manage it? And he told me this phrase and it's kind of stuck with me over the years. And he said, merchandise is like bananas. They come in green and they have value as they start to turn yellow. We need to start marking them down as they get brown spots because they turn brown because when they turn brown, they are no good. To some degree, we're in the produce business. And then the other thing that he added to that was, when you have items that are in your golf shop sitting around, they start to spoil the other items around there. So think about that as you start to 
manage your material and how you get it off the floor and how you get it out of the golf shop is something very important. When I was at Hay Harbor Club, I was uh, not good at this. And I'd end up at the end of the year and I'd say, okay, let's have a big blowout sale and move all this merchandise. Um, and it really was unfulfilling because you did all this hard, hard work and selling things at, at full retail. And then it's uh, cutting your losses at the end. So we really put together a strategy where we have a, a designated clearance area. Um, once we start getting into mismatch sizes, if I've got a medium and a double XL, it's going straight to the clearance. I don't care if it's been the most popular shirt in the golf shop, it's moving out so we can display fresh goods and make sure we're having good turnover. I did my final internship at Bandon Dunes. Now this has been um, 16 years ago now. And um, they never discounted their golf shop in a sell environment. And Mike Kaiser said, we never wanted to de devalue or put our brand as a sell. However, if we're out of size runs, it goes to the clearance because we never want a consumer to come in and purchase something and they no longer can get their hands on it in their particular size. So I've kind of re-implemented that in a smaller scale of, of a private club environment uh, versus a resort environment. But I think that's something that you can look at for your own shops and continue to grow from there. Uh, final thoughts, do simple well. It's very easy to overlook the basics. Um, I don't care if it's April 1st or December 31st. If a member comes in and says, I'm looking for a white performance shirt, you should be able to provide that for them. So stick to your solids um, as far as your basics, your whites, your navy, uh, 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 mid blue. Make sure you have plenty of kind of your feeder stripes, uh, mini stripes. If we look down at our breakdown on an annual basis, from a men's perspective, we sell about 85% stripes and 15% solids. And I would say of that 85% stripes, I'm going to say that probably 60% of those live in the white and blue orientations. That's our clientele. So find out what your matrix is, and then you can help build that out so you're not having all this leftover inventory at the end of the year. Um, continue to invest in your fixtures and display pieces. Signs by the Sea, I saw that Matt had that up there um, on his displays earlier. We have it complimenting almost every table we have. We've got a mini bench, different signs. Again, it just adds a little bit of pop, a little bit of uniqueness to your displays. You sell a few pieces here and there, but again, it's more of an investment of, of merchandising to improve your sales of your soft goods. And you're a walking mannequin. Invest in your wardrobe and dress in the product you're selling. Uh, after all, you're the golf professional. If, if your member wants to go buy a new set of wedges, they're gonna come and talk to you. If you're out playing with a member, they're gonna ask, hey, Pro, I like those shoes. What are those? So dress in the newest product that you can. Um, invest in yourself. You're going to sell more goods by wearing the product than you ever will by folding it and putting it on a table. So continue to make that investment. And, and study, study the materials. Um, you know, does anybody in here know the difference between like a piquet and a jersey shirt? It seems so basic. Yet I walk into golf shops and I ask that question or, or during the interview process and ask that question and I, I get looked at like I'm a deer in headlights. Um, understand the different applications of how shirts are made, um, what their performance benefits are. A lot of people think piquets feel rough. They're actually the most breathable shirt on the market. Um, it's what I wear all summer long. During the winter time, I transition into a cotton shirt and sweaters and, and five pockets. But um, you know, make sure that you, you have your image and understand those different pieces that complement the time of year, complement your product in your golf shop, and educate your membership. The more they're educated, the more they're gonna purchase from you. Again, if there's anything we can do from our perspective to help kind of talk about visual displays, uh, managing your materials in your golf shop, feel free to reach out. Um, happy to help in any way. I appreciate everybody being on here and, and taking a few minutes to learn something other than teaching golf and learning a little bit about the, the golf shop aspect of things. So thank you for your time. So Mike, that was awesome. Um, talk a little bit. So, you know, I know obviously you and Jeff very well and, and with, with you guys a lot, but talk about how do you work your staff so that, you know, you have a lot of great knowledge. Matt had a lot of great knowledge about what's going on. How do you, you know, teach your staff and, and coordinate your staff to, to help, you sell the merchandise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure that my team sometimes gets uh, gets aggravated at me because I'm always asking questions about, uh, you know, tell me something unique about shoes rain jacket. Um, 
or what, what tell me the story of be dratty so i think that education process comes in trying getting them involved in the buying process if you have your companies coming in i'd encourage all the head professionals on here to to get their assistance involved in the buying, buying process just from an education standpoint they don't necessarily have to be making the final decision but if you can get them in there learning from the vendors um the other thing we're doing is we're going to we're going to coach. I'm going to spend a lot of time trying to coach on how we want our, our shirts displayed. When Again, kind of referencing my, my time at Bandon Dunes, our, our first, first day at work, we had our internship, you know, sit down. There were 21 of us, and we get all of our goods for the year. And the merchandiser comes in, hands us all of our shirts. When we're working at Bandon Trails, you're wearing these five shirts, so on and so forth. So I think we had about 25 pieces. And we all got a ream of paper, and they said, learn how to paper fold. You can't leave this room until you can paper fold. So we had to paper fold everything. And then they sent us home and said, you all live on club property. We're coming in tomorrow to check to make sure all the goods you brought with you are paper folded. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So uh, after two days, I probably paper folded about 200 garments. And I learned that and, and kind of learned the different techniques to it. And again, we're just sharing that along the way. I will say from a visual display, I try to give them a lot of ownership on that. Um, if it's everything that I see, the golf shop never has a different look. Um, my views and Jeff's views are usually different on how to display. Same for Andrew and Brendan. But what we can do is we can create different looks throughout the season displaying the same merchandise. So uh, getting them actively engaged in it, I think, is the most important part. Awesome. Very good. Uh, if anybody's got any more questions for Mike or for Matt, either one, um, kind of throw them in the chat here. I will remind everybody, if you haven't put your membership number in, please do so. Miss Christine will like that much better if you put your number in there, uh, especially if you can remember it, Mr. Joe Franz. But uh, anybody else have any more questions here? I've got a question for Matt Fuller. Matt, so the e-commerce, I know that you've seen growth from your, your sales altogether. Have you seen any kind of uh, decrease in your golf shop sales or has that stayed flat or continued to grow? Mike, it continued to grow. It was kind of an abnormal year for us, so I can't really look at 19 to 20 as being normal. But it's like I think Dave made the comment earlier. Our selling online is such a small percentage of our overall sales because of how much volume we have is that it's our online sales don't take away at all from uh, uh, sales in person. So as we're setting goals, you know, certainly, you know, as a team, on building out our e-commerce, it's, it's, you know, it goes hand in hand with, um, with the growth of our physical shop. So the physical shop is ultimately important. You know, it's, 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 you know, you've been to our shop. I've been to your shop, your shop. That was, by the way, that presentation was awesome. Good job. But, um, you know, the looks of our shop, the mannequins, it's very important. The physical shop is not going away. Just for us, this is just a, you know, another online channel uh, avenue to build another revenue stream and engage our members. Yeah, so one thing, just continuing a little bit of conversation here, um, Summit Golf Brands, Fairway and Green did club code this year. I don't know if you guys took advantage of that or if anybody here on, on the call um, did that. We saw wonderful growth on it. It's a little different than the e-commerce aspect. You're just getting a kickback, essentially. Um, but it was great. It, it, it was one of those things I kind of forgot about it, and then you know, end of September hits and here comes another cash flow that came in. So um, it's definitely something that I'm interested in, uh, probably at a smaller scale than where you guys are going with it. But I think that there's definitely a thirst for it. But I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we like to pride ourselves on is that that intimate relationship with your membership. I know that when we were doing the um, Google Drives aspect, you know, putting a handwritten note, thanks for supporting the golf shop during these challenging times in their box when they come pick it up. So I think that there's a lot of good to it um, and look forward to trying to introduce it at our club. No, I think that's awesome. Um, you know, like I said, I, it's the e-commerce is never going to take the place of the physical shopping experience. I think it only ha enhances the exclusive ex experiences with, for the overall package. And, you know, anybody that's on this call, if you have any, um, you know, if you're considering building out a shop, I mean, I'm available, Mike's available, you can email, you can call us. Um, and happy to answer any more questions uh, offline anytime. Tim, we're going to end with this. We got one more question here. Um, any best practices you've seen or done to increase your corporate business from your membership? 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's that's been a kind of an ongoing thing for 14 years since I've been at Caves. I mean, I would say back in 2009 was really the kind of the year that we took it head on. We started to pursue our corporate members with more corporate options, dual branding. Um, a, a rather large percentage of our members are corporate, so that was kind of a that was kind of a, an area that was untapped at that time. And since then, it just continues to grow. And then once you get once you get a corporate member on board with um, supporting the shop, you know, ordering product with their logo on the sleeve and Case Valley on the chest, then it's just a reoccurring sale. I mean, the next year they'll just they'll, they'll call you up or I'll shoot him a reminder and he'll say, hey, can I look at that Peter Millard catalog? And who knows, he'll place a 50 or 100 unit order. So we're, we're doing that constantly. Mike? I'm not gonna be able to provide on this. Um, we're pretty strict on our, our logoing procedures. We're not allowed to do any kind of co-branding. Um, and we also very much look at it as, as a family oriented club and it's not something that we're gonna promote. I do have a few few members that have gone through some corporate stuff with us without the Green Spring logo if they want to do some Malar shirts, but it, we're not really at the, our facility is, is far different from cave structure and how we would market that to our membership. So it's really something I'm not gonna provide a lot on. Okay. Anybody else, any other questions anybody has? Sean, I, think, Go Sean, ahead. I think Jason Mills has a, a question for Mike that's uh, uh, pretty good. Jason Mills, there we go. Mike, you mentioned bringing in new lines in small batches. What process do you use in that selection process? Yeah, so really good question. Um, first off, I try to look at it of, of where I'm trying to generate this to look. If it's going to be more of a athleisure for ladies, um, then obviously I'm going to start going in those specific zones. Um, you know, we introduced Grayson this year. They've been known for their prints um, with super detailed prints. Um, that was something we brought in a small piece. Um, you know, I think we brought in 28 units at the beginning of the year and, and a small shot drop in the fall. Um, but really, it's a shame that we didn't have the PGA show this year because that's really what I spend the entire show doing is I very rarely see my normal um, vendors when I'm at the show, I'm, I'm searching for these unique things that are, are up and coming, something that I think has a good story. Holderness and Born, um, if you don't carry them, it was a company that uh, was pretty small four or five years ago. Uh, it was one of their first accounts at Hay Harbor Club um, and brought them as just as kind of a test. And now they're one of our main staples at, at Greenspring. So I look at it to see what I'm trying to hit, what kind of market I'm trying to hit, if it's, if it's sweaters, you know, I'm looking differently than if I'm trying to cater to our younger membership that's going to be, you know, 20 to 35 years old. That's more on that edgy aspect, look wearing the trucker hats and, and printed shirts. So uh, it really depends what avenue I'm going down. But um, again, the show is great. It's terrible that it didn't happen this year. Um, I'll probably be making some phone calls to some of my West Coast connections to see what's new out there in their side of the world and, and see if we can't splash something in this year. Very good information. Gentlemen, thank you very much for both of you. Uh, let's see here. Hold on, Jeremy. What are you asking me here? So Jeremy Greiner, Sean, can you ask her? Attended the virtual show. Um, so yes, uh, actually, if you can throw in the chat right now, Jeremy Greiner has a question. How many of you uh, went to the virtual, the, I guess you could say the virtual PGA show last week? Um, and how, you know, so if you were active last week doing that, kind of throw it in the chat and, and uh, see who uh, was attending that. But otherwise, I want to thank uh, Mike and Matt both. And uh, David obviously was on earlier. Um, I couldn't harass him anymore about uh, Ohio State uh, whooping up on Michigan, but uh, that was always, uh, it's always fun with Dave. Uh, so any more questions, but thank you very much for everybody getting involved and being here today. Hopefully everybody's dug out of the snow and uh, we'll see everybody soon, hopefully playing golf. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.